In this fourth and final video on scripting in React, we'll be looking at layer scripts. And those are more to be considered background scripts that will be running regardless of uh, button presses uh, and so on. So far, uh, so far, we have been looking at scripts related to behaviors, so being executed the moment you receive a trigger on a behavior. And uh, it's all done with a configuration for a quick bar, which we um, have provided inside of Reactor called demo scripting. And uh, with that, you can play with all these examples yourself and get inspiration for your own code. Notice this is better software. There is um, much further to go for us. So uh, we need more uh, debugging tools. We need more safety around execution. We need ways to monitor if scripts are running and how many resources they take. And, there's a lot of things. And probably some of those ideas are in your head as well. So we encourage you to work with this, play with it, and send us feedback so that we know how this can be even more useful for you. But you are encouraged to play with it already and in that way contribute to our development as well. So uh, quite often when we work with scripting, it's basically a matter of having some logic execution around getting and setting IO references, being able to uh, have some sleep, uh, in between so that the execution is uh, done responsibly, uh, you know, while we are waiting for things and so on. And those are the functions that are implemented. But quite often I would keep such as the a device call manual reference open like this one, which is the huge ATEM device call where you can find all the parameters for ATEM switches, basically. All the models of ATEM switches that we have supported, including Blackmagic cameras, and then all the parameters that exist for these. In this case, we'll be looking at um, actually uh, making a docking function uh, for the ATEM switch we see right here. So the intention is something like this. Whenever we have camera number three on program, the audio fader here will go to a certain location. And if we are changing back from uh, away from it, like um, making a cut like this, um, then we, uh, we will see the audio go to another position. And then we'll also be recording this value. So that's the end goal of this uh, episode. And for that, we uh, would need to find the correct ATEM switcher um, parameter inside this list. Let's first look at how these uh, scripting features look inside Reactor. Uh, you can see in the background here, I have a little uh, locking console output from Reactor because this is the uh, currently the only way we can sort of monitor what happens in the scripts. And we'll see this is how it's also being used inside of here. Previous episodes, we had these um, four scripted button behaviors. Inside of each of these, there were some scripts that we could study and um, play with. The latest one we played with was this scripted button number four. And uh, if we open that up, browse down to the event script, we can see the script of that one looks like this. And this is what we did in the previous episode in the script editor. But let's just close this one down. And then we can see this layer with scripts is the one that has the scripts installed that we'll be now looking at. And we have two scripts. We have one called uh, doc volume and testing. I'm sorry about the green color here. It's a little bit hard to see, but they are both there. Let's first look at testing and see what that one does. It, it looks really basic and uh, it says um, just for all eternity, we'll just keep running this. We'll um, read the value of a variable called check loop. And if that is on, then um, we'll basically wait 500. If that is not on, I mean, if check loop is not on, then we'll just wait 500 milliseconds and check it again. But if check loop is on, then we'll see this one happening. We'll increase the value of the variable A, which is currently zero. Then we will uh, write this out to the console so we should see it appear over here. And then we'll set the IO reference values of a variable called A to the value of A, sleep 500 milliseconds, and then repeat. So sounds easy. And um, so to basically see this, I have a layer up here called no name. Sorry about that. And if I uh, toggle the shift key <clears throat> here, we see that the value of A is currently NA, so um, not available, default value apparently. If I uh, toggle this button, I'm changing the value of the check loop variable to on. And if that happens, we should see our script running. 
I do think there is another condition to this script as well, and I'm not sure it's actually so visible down here. There are other things that I wanted to check uh, too. First of all, this minus one, and it should say runtime. I don't know why it doesn't, but it doesn't. And uh, this is part of the cleanup still. Runtime of minus one means that this script is going to run forever. Otherwise, it has like a max runtime of 100 milliseconds or something. But you change that in here. It's the number of seconds that you are setting for the max execution time. But what I would prefer to do would probably be to just check the JSON for this layer, because that JSON code is helpful, um, not so much for the script contents, because that's a very long line in these cases, but it is helpful for the description. And uh, the testing script that we are looking at at the beginning here has this max runtime on minus one. The same is true for the dark volume script, but it's also active if run loop is on. Okay, so the script is actually only running if that run loop is on. How can I know? Let's just go back here. No, there will be no indication if the script is running or not. We are going to take a look at the console over here. If I um, click this one, we should actually have the script running. And it probably won't tell us unless, let me see if we have anything here. Uh, that is the other script, the dark volume script. Okay, we'll come back to that. But now if I uh, notice what happens when I enable or if I change the value of the check loop variable from off to on, you'll see something is happening over here. So now I go back to off and it just stalls and then I put it to on and it's keeping counting again off. It stops counting. Now it's counting again and so on. So this is this little script just running all the time, checking if the check loop variable is on and if it's not, it will just wait. Otherwise, it will simply increase the value of A and write it out to the variable. So the other one, the other script, the dark volume script is much more complex than that, but it's also enabling itself on the dark volume. Actually, we, we should probably just check it here because you can see it's now counting. But if I turn it off by changing run loop to off, then altogether this condition, run loop being off like that, is um, prohibiting it from running even though check loop is on, okay? So there's like two ways we can now turn it on and off. The check loop variable is one that is being checked inside the script, while the run loop variable is an external condition on whether the script is running or not. So we see for the dark volume script, which is the next thing we'll be looking at, we have the dark volume variable uh, determining whether the script is running or not. And uh, let's read the description so we know what to expect. It docks the volume of channel three when it is not on ME1 program. Okay, now we could just try to uh, to see what happens if that is mimicked on the uh, ASIM switcher. So let's just, um, we, we have it running apparently right now. We move over to the ASIM software control. Uh, channel number three is this one. This is the value that we are currently seeing. Let's um, change over to three on program, go back to audio. You can see it's changing here. And now for the convenience of you, I will just operate the ASIM switcher by pressing the button up here. I press the cut button right now and you can see that as I'm pressing the cut button, I'm apparently also changing the, um, the, the volume of this channel. All right. So, um, yes, I can show you another feature of this one because it's constantly monitoring if channel no, or input number three is on programming or, or not. And um, it, if I change the value right now to this, for instance, and then I press the cut button, you can see it goes back to the previous value, but it actually records the value that I put it into. So when it's making that change, it will read out what is the value here. It's, it's 2880. And then it goes up here to almost four. If I change this value to 580, and then you can see it goes back to 2880. 520, 2880, and so on. So that is also built into the script. Now, let's take a look at the script so that we uh, can study the, the coding behind it. So we open this one called doc uh, volume, and uh, inside of it, we have some variables that stores the volume in the on case and the off case. It also has some uh, values of the stored volume uh, on in it and off in it. And um, then it has recorded which channel is it. It's channel three or input number three and ME row number one and um, so on. So there are some variables here that are stored inside the script. Of course, we have seen in previous um, episode on scripting that those values could be defined in constants outside so that 
instead of having it hard coded in the script, you could take this value from a constant or from a constant set, import it into your script, and in that way, you would have taken a parameter and brought out to people on the home screen, for instance. And that's entirely up to you how much information you'll give people uh, on the home screen. The home screen is really our idea of where you will break out all the configuration that is most necessary or you know that is supposed to be editable by the user and then in the configuration tab you have basically programming of your controller something that the the average user is not supposed to to dabble in so um but let's go back to the script and study this a little bit so we are now looking at what is the current source that we have on program by getting the IO reference uh, or the parameter value for program input video source of the ATEM switcher. You can take this one, you can run it, um, search for it here in your um, device call manual. And by the way, if you want that device call manual to be uh, visible to you, go to the home screen, click the pencil next to your device call, click parameter list. This is true for ATEM switches, video hubs, routers, cameras of any type. This is how you access all the parameters that you may want to interact with. And basically by searching for this one, you can uh, find it. You can also find information for how this looks for any of the ATEM switcher models that we are working with here. Uh, go back to the script. <clears throat> if the current source and program equals channel, so that's the condition we are setting. Then we're executing this code. If it is not, then we're executing this code. So luckily, this is not such a crazy script like we have seen before. Let, let's Basically, these are probably inverse of each other, these, these two. But we are basically saying if the stored volume is blank, in other words, we need to initialize, then we'll basically make the stored volume the initial volume. In other words, this value right here. Then we are setting a variable to false. Then we are writing something out to the console. And then we're using this channel active to make sure that we do things only once. So we are basically saying if the channel, and um, this is if the current program source equals channel, then we are, we are basically using channel active to determine whether we have already changed the volume. And if channel active is not the case, then we will make it the case because the channel is active. Then we'll set the value to the stored volume. And we do that by setting the value of the Fairlight Audio Mixer Input Volume Position, which is, if we search it up here, that value. So you can see it's the floating point between 0 and 100, so normalized. And we have these inputs that uh, is the first dimension of the uh, variable. And that first dimension is being inserted in the IO reference that we are putting into this function set IO reference values, and then we are locking it out to the console. And then if the channel active uh, is true, in other words, we have done this already once, then all we do every time is to read that IO reference out and store it in the variable stored volume on. And then we're doing this the exact uh, same, but you know inverse for the case where it is a different source that is on the channel. So that's a little script that will do this uh, docking for us. Um, it's almost like it could be fun to see if we could make it fade the audio instead of just make a hard cut on the audio. But I am not sure if I want to set out to do that in this case. Um, start volume on. Hmm, hmm. What kind of value is that? That's an, that is a, yeah. I think I'll leave that over to the reader basically. But what you would do if you wanted to fade it, <clears throat> then you would make, Yeah, okay, why not try? Okay, so um, <clears throat> what is the current value? That would be the stored volume of. The stored volume of would be probably to be assumed to be the current value of these. So I would say, okay, um, I would look up JavaScript pass value to float. Okay. Pass float method. Okay. How does that work? 
So it can take any string because mostly we are working with strings and then it gives me a float here. Okay, so maybe pass float is a good idea to use. Okay, so I'll just make a variable and call it um, start volume equals pass float and then the start volume off. I'll make an end volume and say this is the one, this is our destination. And then uh, can I use the variable A? A my, so over 10 steps, I just want to do this over 10 steps. And because this is JavaScript, we need to do that. And then just put it in here. Okay, like that format code, thanks. Okay, something is wrong. Am I not allowed to do this? So it's different programming languages. I'm used to Go, so I need to um, sleep. Okay, if I want to know that the sleep function is there, I can use the control, um, uh, control space, and then you see we have the sleep function here. So that is one of the five known functions that the system has for us. And we'll just wait 100 milliseconds and we need a semicolon at the end like that. Okay, so um, so now we're fading over one second, basically. And then I would say <clears throat> that over here and I wonder if this will work, but we'll take the start volume and then we'll basically add the and volume minus the start volume. And then we'll divide that by 10 and then we'll multiply it by A. So, um, and I would kind of say that we should then let A run from one to 10. Okay, because then what happens is that we start out with a start volume and then the difference between the start and the end volume divided by 10 and then multiplying by a number between one and 10. So eventually we will actually have the exact ending volume here. So this should work. Let's try it out. So let's save this file. And then um, ah, now I'm actually a little bit afraid if this. Yeah, OK, we have saved it. And then let's just see what happens if we make a change to the switcher. Yes, <laughs> pretty cool, right? So it's actually fading in over 10 steps, as we can see right now, you know, as I'm pressing this, uh, the, the cut button, but it's only doing it in one direction, because obviously we have only implemented it in, in, in one direction in this case. Okay, but still fun that it was possible. Now you can go and implement it in the, in the second case. So it's also fading back down if you want to and um, have fun with that part of it. But this is how you can run scripts on layers like a background script and uh, have it monitor things in your system. So it's like it, it resembles quite a lot what you can do with virtual triggers. Virtual triggers are also features in Reactor that is um, designed to listen to the value of IO references and based on any change in value, execute a an event, send an event into a behavior so that you could, for instance, make values, uh, you could monitor values for a uh, input on an output on a video router and then mimic that on an ASIM switch or something like that. So those types of automation jobs can be do with virtual triggers, but you could also uh, try to write a script and then make a script monitor and, and follow such values and perform logic around them.